Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome everyone to this timely and essential webinar on optimizing industrial networking in embedded systems. I'm Brian Tristan Williams with Elector. If you're an embedded designer, you know the hurdles of dealing with multiple industrial networks like Profinet, Ethercat, and Ethernet, IP, not to mention cloud communication protocols like IoT and MQTT. Today, we're diving into how to consolidate these disparate networking tasks into a single embedded solution with one universal software interface. Doing this can slash your project risks and cut your development time by a staggering 70%. We'll tackle the nitty gritty of network protocol development, the challenges you face as an embedded en engineer, and how to make these different networks play nicely together, all while staying true to each protocol's individual standards. Stick around and you'll walk away with actionable insights and tools to make your life a whole lot easier. Let's get started. First, we'll welcome our first guest, guest Kurt van Buhl. Kurt is no stranger to the realm of embedded solutions. How are you today, Kurt? I'm doing well. Lovely weather in the Netherlands. Ah, great. He boasts over 25 years of experience in both designing and selling them to the industrial automation market, whether it's uh, rapid design in embedded industrial ethernet nodes or customizing IIoT on a chip products. Kurt is the go-to guy for enabling industry 4.0 and IIoT connectivity for HMS customers. He's yet to share his hands on experience and practical know-how, so you'll definitely want to pay attention. Welcome aboard, Kurt. And next up, let me introduce okay. you to our second esteemed guest, Terry Bieber. Terry is a heavyweight in the field of industrial communication. How are you this morning, Terry? I'm very well. Thank you. Great. I hope the weather's also good where you are. It's, it's lovely here in almost, Germany. Almost, almost sunny. <laughs> okay. So, Terry uh, deals with IIoT solutions and he focuses on business development in the industrial automation market. And he has an impressive track record spanning over two decades. So, he brings a wealth of technical and market experience to the table. That's not all. Terry is also an active participant in key standardization organizations like Profinet International, ODVA, VDMA, and ZVEI. That's quite a, a mouthful. He's yet to share his insights and expertise, so you definitely won't want to miss what he has to say. Welcome, Terry, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Brian, for this uh, awesome introduction. I'm sharing now my screen. I hope you, yes, you should see it. Perfectly. Thank you for this introduction. And as you said it, uh, industrial co uh, communication, this is the core topic of, uh, of the webinar of today. Um, with the digitalization of our industry, we see an increasing need for sensor and devices that are located at the production level to share the data. And uh, the question that rises a lot from our customers is, how do I connect my device in this uh, industrial environment? How do I uh, connect it to industrial PLCs uh, in this uh, on the production line, but also several further communication uh, like ME to MES to SCALA systems? And here uh, we will see in the first part of this um, webinar uh, the diversity and the challenges related to the implementation. Uh, we will see as well in the second part how to address this challenge, what are the different solutions, and especially focus on how you can optimize uh, in order to achieve a cost-effective uh, implementation, but as well a future-proof uh, implementation of this uh, interface. So it, let's start and briefly take a couple of minutes to introduce HMS. HMS is the company that I'm working for. HMS is a, is a group specialized in different industrial communication and, in, in, and information communication technologies. Uh, maybe better known as the HMS uh, group, uh, these are the brands that are included in this group uh, with the brand Anybus, specific, uh, with specific expertise in, in the field bus in the industry design communication. And this will be the topic of today. And with, Eason, with Anybus, we provide a connectivity solution that are integrated in devices. And we have today over 9 million devices which implement our uh, solution, that means automation devices that are installed across uh, across any uh, factory in the world. We, our customers here are uh, companies like Rockwell, Schneider, Mitsubishi, many other drive uh, and sensor manufacturers. 
Other uh, brands, E1 for remote access and uh, cloud connectivity, Intesis for building automation technologies, and Ixat for in-vehicle communication. The group HMS is a Swedish company uh, based in Hamstad, uh, and we are now reaching the 800 employees with a revenue of last year of uh, 225 million euros. We are, uh, without contest, a market leader in this in this uh, in this segment of industrial communication. But let's jump to the to the topic. And uh, each year uh, we publish our uh, picture of the, the markets of the industrial Ethernet uh, market shares. And um, this year, this is how we see the splits, the current splits in uh, field bus technologies. Um, in different field, different, uh, you see here, it's a huge um, um, split in technologies with the, the traditional serial-based field buses, which were uh, strong over the past years and uh, today growing now. Uh, one quarter of the devices, of the industrial devices sold uh, last year, or sorry, this year. Um, yeah, it's based on the on the number of last years. Sold last year were based on these old uh, serial field buses. Uh, since uh, four or five years, the industrial Ethernet technologies are uh, outperforming and have uh, overtaken largely these uh, this traditional serial-based field buses. And we see now um, communication based on wireless technologies that are uh, challenging these existing uh, wired-based technologies with a strong growth and always um, yeah, always stronger growth based on the easiness to install uh, on uh, new but as well on existing uh, infrastructure. So addressing industrial network challenges will lead you to uh, implement certainly a large diversity of uh, protocols here. Um, the second point when we start uh, the discussion with our customers, the first uh, challenge is that we are um, addressing with them is to identify the market requirements which market, which technology do you need to address? And especially this uh, technology, uh, different technologies that needs to, to be implemented are really depending as well on the market, the geographic territory that you need to address, but as well the different um, applications that you, that you need to address. And here you will need to select the ones that you need to add, but as well, uh, based on the different markets, you will have different, um, functionality that uh, you will need to implement. And that is a uh, first part of the definition of the functionalities you need to add. Once you have defined that, um, our customer as next challenge see the uh, resources and expertise challenge. If there are complex technologies to implement, so you need to build up a knowledge on this technology you need to implement and they are very often confronted to uh, limited resources and limited time frame to address this implementation. And once you have um, started, you have your first implementation done, um, you have here to very often a full portfolio of devices that you need to uh, implement this uh, solution, this connectivity in, in, in various devices. But the next step is as well, once your product are outside in the field, you need to manage the, the life cycle. So going a little bit more uh, in the details um, of a development phase, it's uh, very often implementing an, an industrial communication uh, interface. Uh, it's related to a hardware, first a hardware implementation. Uh, secondly, you need to interface this, um, this software or this interface with your, uh, you need to implement this software side of the interface. You need to fully test, not only internal, but uh, very often it's related to a certification process uh, for with each of the networking organization. And then you start to produce your device. You have the launch. But most of the time, what we figure out is that the biggest uh, effort has then to be spent in the whole maintenance phase of, uh, of your product. Uh, which consists of supporting your devising, getting getting hit, getting it uh, reliable in the design, but as well maintaining 
um, this communication interface up to date as these um, network functionalities are constantly evolving, constantly um, implementing new capabilities uh, to cover the new requirement of the industry, you will need as well to, to, to look for um, implementing or following this next, uh, um, this next step. So uh, taking that uh, from, a, from a global perspective, implementing different, um, different field buses, different industry leasing protocols, so that means getting your device connected for the industry, it's not a, a straight forward path. And today we want to address that. And Kurt, I will give you the next um, step to start, I would say, highlighting the different solutions that exist. Thank you, uh, uh, Jerry. Uh, and at the moment, you want to uh, uh, implement uh, an industrial uh, uh, internet network. Of course, you have to handle with uh, uh, WSD, hard and, uh, and, and software. That's, an, that's quite an open door. But please note that not all networks are handled at, uh, exactly the same way. The first generation of uh, networks like uh, uh, Modbus TCP and Ethernet uh, uh, IP and Profinet uh, IO were using uh, uh, the, the standard TCP IP setup. You are using uh, uh, an Ethernet uh, Mac on, uh, on the hardware uh, side and, and with help of software you build up a uh, TCP IP uh, stack. Uh, you set up real-time uh, data exchange and on top of that, you, you set up a protocol stack to handle all, uh, uh, all functionalities of a certain protocol. Um, what uh, became clear is that in a real-time uh, uh, um, environment, um, all these layers stacked uh, uh, on top of each other will introduce jitter, simply depending on decisions made in, uh, in software. Some layers are, uh, are on a certain moment skipped or not, which uh, uh, makes jitter in a response to, uh, to, uh, to messages. And therefore, the next generation of, uh, of protocols like uh, Profinet uh, RT and, uh, and Powerlink are using a, a software bypassing. All uh, uh, the complete uh, TCP IP uh, stack uh, uh, and the real-time data exchange uh, uh, um, is compressed into one single software uh, solution. And uh, the Mac uh, became hardware systems to get a faster response by buffering and all that type of, uh, uh, of items. The latest uh, uh, generation of, uh, of protocols, I, uh, like Profinet uh, IoT or uh, Ethercat, uh, are using a fully hardware-assisted uh, solution. Um, um, the the real-time Ethernet Mac, uh, uh, the data uh, exchange, and even partly the TCP IP when, when needed, are uh, all handled in, uh, in hardware. And there's a direct exchange towards uh, uh, the, the protocol uh, stack. Please note, mo the majority of all these protocols are working on uh, uh, 100, uh, uh, 10.00 MB. But um, only uh, uh, CC-Link from Mitsubishi at the moment is a gigabit uh, a network. But, um, other manufacturers are developing at the moment gigabits networks uh, as well, not for uh, uh, much more uh, uh, real-time uh, uh, aspects, but especially to, uh, um, to pass uh, additional uh, uh, data uh, uh, to central uh, systems, uh, uh, for, for, ex for example, for quality assurance later on. It means that uh, uh, if you want to implement um, different uh, protocols and if you see the um, the market shares of the individual uh, protocols you are uh, uh, quite easily uh, involved with, uh, with multiple protocols you have to implement all these hardware differences as well and uh, um, not only the hardware is uh, 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 is different um, um, also the software stacks are uh, are different First of all, for all these individual protocols, you have uh, uh, to set up different protocol stacks. And all those stacks have to be connected towards 
your, uh, your hardware. So you have to set up interfaces, drivers, and that part. And at the moment, you want to implement safety. The correspo corresponding safety stacks are coming on, uh, on top. And Jerry already indicated uh, uh, cloud communication. Uh, uh, protocols like OPC UE and MQTT come with some different uh, stacks as well. And if that's not enough, product marketing will have uh, some uh, additional app requests as well. They want to have a web browser for, uh, uh, for setting up a device. They want to have email possibilities to alert customers when, when something goes wrong. They want to have FTP solutions for, for later software updates, et cetera, et cetera. And all these stacks you have to handle. And as we are all well aware, uh, software is not standardized. There's no vendor offering all these uh, uh, stacks in the same approach. So you have different vendors with different structures, different interfaces, and different drivers. And when you have updates uh, on one of those stacks, uh, uh, a vendor will inform you that they have released a new version as well. Besides the vendor aspects, uh, um, there are quite some differences uh, uh, between those protocols as well. Uh, um, quite some protocols are non-TCP IP. So that is an, a challenge if you want to combine that with, for example, uh, um, cloud communication or, or always email. Um, between all those stacks, you have to keep in the real-time priority and you have to avoid software interference between individual data. So what I show here is a beautiful uh, uh, um, management uh, 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 image uh, uh, to show that it's all possible is in reality completely different. Multiple protocol software development is a very complex task. Which possibilities we, uh, uh, we have to overcome those, uh, uh, those issues? And therefore, I would like to uh, um, uh, show you uh, uh, technical implementation solutions which are available uh, uh, in the market. And uh, a first principle system solution is the use of an ASIC. If you only have to Im implement one uh, uh, industrial Ethernet, uh, uh, you can select an, uh, ASIC, an ASIC which supports that lower part of your, uh, of your protocol. So for Ethercut, you could, for example, select a back of ET1100. If you have to implement several protocols, there are microcontrollers already supporting uh, uh, all uh, uh, the top five uh, Ethernet uh, um, protocols, for example, the TI Citera uh, series. And if you want to have it flexible, you have microcontrollers with quite a large FPGA, like the Siling Sync, uh, where you can get libraries for individual protocols. But please note that when I go back to uh, uh, the diagram in the, in the earlier uh, uh, slides, all these protocols are, uh, uh, are focusing on the lower part, on the harder part of, uh, uh, of the interface implementation, which means that you have to do all the protocol software uh, uh, on top. Some, uh, um, um, some uh, semiconductor manufacturers uh, uh, support you with that as well as a complete uh, package. Uh, um, but it's not a core business, which means that uh, uh, um, uh, it's set up in a laboratory to, to function once for a certain application, which don't uh, make clear that it will fulfill uh, uh, your application as well. Another solution is to go for uh, a complete brick or a, a, a module like our uh, Anibus Compact Com uh, solutions. Then you are quite flexible. Uh, and important, uh, it's a combination of uh, uh, the hardware and the, uh, uh, the software. So you have a complete solution in, uh, uh, at once. And if we compare all those principal uh, uh, solutions, then you, you can say that uh, a brick or a module is coming with built-in uh, stacks, while the others uh, uh, um, don't, uh, uh, don't provide a stack. And that also means that for certification, a module and a brick is already pre-certified. I use the term pre-certified because the certification organizations request a total application to be certified, 
not only the uh, the interface, but the interface is already uh, uh, certified. Down the line, uh, from a business perspective, uh, uh, it's all depending on the amount of uh, of your total uh, volume and the amount of protocols you want to to implement. ASICs have low cost, but have quite some additional investments to uh, um, uh, to start up. On the other uh, uh, perspective, on the other side of, of the field, uh, uh, a module has a very low uh, uh, initial cost, simply the cost of a module. Uh, um, but the the cost uh, in uh, uh, um, the cost in production will be higher. So. Uh, the total business cases depending on several items to come to an optimal uh, uh, solution. How that uh, how that will work out uh, uh, will be uh, uh, presented by by Cherry, focusing on uh, on bricks and on uh, uh, modules. Good, thank you, Kurt, for this first uh, part. Um, now let's deep dive a little bit stronger on this on the approach. What is uh, what is this solution? What is included? How does it work? How to implement this solution? First, um, what are the different options, brick and module, and what are the benefits? The module is uh, here a complete uh, an all-in-one module. That means it includes the communication processors, which uh, covers which implements the functionalities of the network but with the connector and all um, is provided as a slide in module that you can either add on your device in the production during the production before they bring by the customer or that customers on site can add on your device after um, as an after sales option so that means you can sell a device and later update uh, your device with network communication capabilities the second option is our brick uh, version this is a more compact form factor um, it is then integrated as a daughter board uh, on your on your existing pcb design and it can here and it's more compact. It's as well uh, than more adapted for more constrained form factor or devices that are compact, more compact. But as well, if you have specific connectors to comply with, like for example, if you have uh, M12 for IP67 uh, housing, um, you can here more freely interface that or integrate that in your device. And as it's more compact, it's more economical, but it does not include as much of the uh, as as the module. So you you will need then to manage this connectivity aspect. So with this module, how does it work? Uh, how does it interface with your host CPU uh, on your device? So as I said, the whole communication is covered by the module. And you will need to implement the software interface in your host um, processor to communicate um, with our module. The network specific communication protocols or functionalities will be handled from our module uh, in order to communicate with the local PLC as an example. In order to synchronize uh, the data that we will share between the two sides, you will need to create an electronic description um, document, an EDS uh, file, uh, there's different names in the different uh, protocols that we will need to support. But this highlights what are the data that you will uh, share from your device to you will inform that the PLC. So that both are on the same side. And your application is focusing on, or your software interface is focusing on this data that you want to send and as well the comment that you want to receive from the PLC. From now on, our module is now taking in charge this low level communication functionalities to synchronize and cyclic and in a very synchronized way, this information with the, with the PLC. So the, the system, the software interface between your processor and our module is protocol natural. That helps you then with our PROFINET module 
in the same way to exchange data with, for example, Siemens devices. And just by exchanging the module or by changing the firmware of our module, uh, you can then go to next um, to the next protocol without very um, with just little changes for your um, host CPU to to take in account new the specific aspect of the new uh, of the new protocols. So Kurt, can you give us a couple more words about how to do now concretely this uh, this implementation in the host CPU? Yeah, of course, uh, uh, Terry. Thank you. Um, what I will uh, present uh, to you is how to set up the hardware, how the software is uh, is, uh, is functioning, uh, and last but not least, how testing is done, so that you have a complete uh, uh, insight uh, on how uh, these type of modules uh, will be uh, uh, will be implemented and uh, uh, starting on uh, on the hardware uh, uh, side we have developed a, a, a special uh, a chip the anybus mp40 uh, which is the heart of each module or uh, or brick and uh, uh, this uh, uh, contains of uh, uh, a cortex m3 microcontroller with all peripherals set up for uh, for real time communication and a large FPGA fabric. And with help of a, a, a single um, firmware uh, package, we uh, uh, download uh, for a specific protocol, the protocol IP, uh, the MAC and uh, uh, the hardware uh, API, API into the FPGA. So for example, for Profinet IRT, we implement uh, 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 IEEE uh, real-time uh, clocking, for uh, for Ethercut, we uh, uh, we implement uh, uh, the typical uh, uh, Ethercut uh, path through uh, uh, gateway, and for PowerLink, as another example, we simply uh, uh, implement uh, uh, an hub uh, uh, structure. On the microcontroller, runs a real-time operating uh, uh, system. Uh, um, the stack uh, um, for uh, the protocol and also some additional uh, uh, stacks. Um, we, uh, we, su we support email, we support browsers, we support F FTP, all those stacks are already uh, uh, implemented. Uh, and there's an uh, uh, API uh, which um, forms um, the, um, the interface towards your uh, target uh, uh, microcontroller in your target uh, application. On the hardware side, we first of all have the interface between the MP40 and uh, the physical uh, network. For every um, uh, for every field bus, this will be uh, uh, different, including DC-DC uh, uh, DC, uh, uh, converters when, uh, uh, when needed. Uh, and that part, including the connector, is always uh, available in the module. So at the moment, you would use a Profibus module it has the Profibus uh, uh, physical layer with the C uh, uh, converter and the Profibus uh, connector. When you use CAN, you will get the CAN physical layer and the typical CAN connector. Uh, and if you use Ethernet, uh, um, you only need uh, an IE45 uh, uh, and a 1000 uh, uh, FI to, uh, uh, to implement, which means that you can do all Ethernet variants except uh, 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 CC link. Uh, uh, with, uh, what, uh, with exactly the same uh, hardware. And you, you could physically change firmware to change from, uh, from protocol if you, if, you would, uh, um, if you would like. On the other side, on the hardware uh, interface side, we're using uh, also a common application interface. And of course, the first which is uh, important is the, uh, uh, is the data exchange. How can we uh, exchange data between your microcontroller and your target application and, uh, and MP40? Uh, and that can be done in parallel in 8 and 16 bits in, uh, with help of uh, SPI or uh, uh, by using a serial uh, uh, link. And of course, the MP40 needs to know which, you, uh, 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 which data uh, mode you, you selected. So with help of some, uh, uh, some pins, you can set 
uh, the right uh, data mode. Secondly, we have some uh, flow and, uh, uh, and control uh, items. We do uh, support an interrupt uh, and we need a reset. And the reset is an important one because you don't connect it to the reset mechanism of your target application, but you use an IO pin on your microcontroller. Why? Well, every PLC will uh, uh, give at startup uh, a command reset communication. And that uh, uh, command is passed to the microcontroller and then the microcontroller has the possibility to hardware reset the MP40 chip uh, and so bringing the complete communication interface into the default uh, state. Uh, furthermore, we, uh, uh, we have some additional uh, uh, I.O. Uh, lines uh, um, available. Uh, we have a detection uh, uh, mode, so uh, uh, you can see whether a module or brick is, uh, 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 um, is installed in, uh, in hardware, so you only have to, uh, to implement it uh, when it's physically available. And there's a hardware identification, and that's uh, especially important for uh, older uh, uh, generations. Um, the first uh, um, MP40, the four, indicates that we're already the fourth generation in, uh, in 25 years. Um, the first generation, for example, only supported uh, serial uh, UART. So at the moment, uh, um, you have an older version and you can select serial UART and with the latest variant, with the latest high-speed protocols, you could go for SPI or parallel, for, for example. And last but not least, we need uh, a uh, uh, power supply. Modules are using uh, a very low amount of, uh, uh, of power in, uh, in general. You don't need heat sinks or that type of items. Important to understand is that uh, um, the, um, the network interface and especially the specification of uh, industrial network uh, uh, um, requests that you can sync over 20 to 30 milliamp, and that goes to uh, um, uh, that goes to the physical network, not to uh, to the chip, uh, to uh, to be clean. Okay, we uh, we have set up the uh, the hardware. How we how we can support all these different uh, uh, networks in the, in the same way from uh, some software, and, and therefore I make first an introduction of uh, uh, of, of how uh, uh, networks are uh, are working. Uh, first, first of all, all networks support acyclic handling, uh, which is uh, a read or write request, always followed by uh, a resp response. Uh, um, could you give me this value? Here you have the value. Set this value to uh, 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 set this variable to a certain value. Uh, I've done it. Always two uh, 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 two two messages and. Uh, it's normally only used for identification and configuration, but some older protocols only support acyclic uh, handling. In a later phase, uh, uh, the PLC starts up real-time uh, uh, communication uh, and is uh, information exchanged uh, real-time. Uh, how that exchange is set up by, uh, uh, by the PLC? Uh, um, the PLC can request to send data every uh, in interval to every 10 or uh, uh, 50 milliseconds, for example. It can ask to send data at the moment it's changed, or it can ask to send data at the moment the sync message is set up to, uh, uh, on the network. The last one is important. If you have two nodes controlling an X and an I uh, uh, axis of an, uh, a machine with help of a sync message, they send exactly the same data on the same moment, so you, you, uh, um, it's synchronized uh, uh, information. Uh, last but not least, uh, um, most protocols are, uh, uh, are supporting alarms and diagnostics uh, uh, items like status or, uh, or heartbeat. It's all done in a different uh, way, but this is in general how uh, uh, real-time uh, networks uh, uh, function. How do we implement that in combination with, an, uh, uh, with, uh, with a module? Well, if we start uh, on the software side, we are using application data objects and application data interfaces. Every information, every variable we uh, exchange over the network uh, uh, is stored inside 
um, inside an object and what those objects contain, I will uh, discuss uh, uh, later. And uh, at the moment they are defined, uh, you can simply request them with the help of uh, acyclic uh, request. Could you give me the, uh, uh, the date of uh, value of an ADI01 that's received by Compacon, it's set up in an object call towards the application. The application gives the right value to Compacon and it's translated by Compacon into to a message. That's quite, uh, uh, quite some work. It's not real time, but it's not needed to be uh, real time. We cite the uh, acyclic uh, general uh, exchange of, uh, of uh, variables. Uh, there are also some special messages. Uh, uh, for example, the PLC can indicate the I.O. mapping. The PLC can indicate which variables will be used for real-time data exchange uh, 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 later on. That's, ex uh, that's exchanged over the network as, uh, uh, as well. Um, also, the uh, PLC can ask to set up uh, uh, the heartbeat. And in that case, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the driver of the driver interface uh, of, of Compact.com will switch on diagnostic handling inside uh, uh, Compact.com. At the moment, the PLC switch on real-time communication. Uh, um, data is exchanged directly uh, uh, between uh, Compact.com and the network, which means that your variables are actually stored inside uh, uh, Compact.com and then uh, are only exchanged towards the um, uh, towards the CPU application uh, uh, when they are updated. Uh, uh, please note, when they are stored in Compact.com, there's also a limit uh, in, uh, in, the amount of soft, in the amount of variables you can store. And that's at this moment uh, uh, roughly 1,500 bytes in both uh, uh, directions. OK, now we understand the, uh, uh, how it's working in general. We Deep in, uh, we uh, take a, a dive into uh, uh, the software interfacing model. Uh, uh, as Jerry already uh, uh, indicated, we have uh, a software uh, interface on your uh, uh, target application, which communicates with uh, um, uh, with uh, Compact.com. And from your application, you will have uh, uh, contact with the adapt layer of this uh, 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 software and. It's uh, the software is OS independent uh, C driver, and we do have customers uh, combining uh, uh, our interface with, with Linux. We do have customers who are using Raspberry Pi type of, uh, uh, of, uh, of solutions. But of course, we have also a lot of customers who won't use an, uh, uh, an operating system and uh, uh, use the, uh, uh, the interface software directly from, from an endless uh, loop. Uh, for example, it's in uh, a POC, so it's always uh, easy to uh, to implement. And first of all, those ADIs are uh, uh, defined. And for each EDI, we uh, define uh, uh, an, uh, a variable name, a data type. Are we discussing uh, bits? Are we discussing bytes? Uh, uh, words, quite words. Uh, um, uh, um, that type of, uh, uh, of variables, and if you are using arrays, the total the total elements of of an array. On the value side, we of course uh, store the actual uh, value. Uh, you can for um, uh, values which can be right, you can set a maximum and a minimum uh, and a default uh, uh, value. And when you set the maximum and min, at the moment, Compact.com receives. Uh, 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 a value outside your, your limits, it will automatically generate uh, uh, um, an error message to, uh, uh, to the PLC and omit the, uh, uh, the value. The second part is the network administration. It's, a, it's a small uh, uh, objects, but they are uh, needed. First of all, at the moment you uh, set up an object for a certain uh, uh, protocol it automatically enable such a protocol so from software you can define which protocols you would like to support or not I important is that almost all 
um, um, protocol owners uh, um, define that you need a specific vendor ID. A vendor ID makes you unique uh, uh, as a unique manufacturer in the network and makes all your products uh, uh, unique. Uh, um, the vendor ID you have to omit from, from the protocol uh, uh, owner. Uh, furthermore, you can set up a product ID, you can set up a, 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 a station name. And uh, uh, some uh, networks, especially the field buses, need specific configuration data. For example, for field buses, you have, you have to set up your communication speed. Uh, last but not least, you, uh, uh, um, uh, you need uh, um, uh, to interfere with, uh, 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 with the driver interface and that you do is keep a live uh, uh, entry. How that works, I will come back uh, later. Um, I already indicated on the hardware side that we have an interrupt. You don't have to write your own interrupt uh, service routine. That's already uh, a part of, uh, uh, of our software uh, interface. And I already indicated that we have much more functionality uh, 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 regarding building web browser, uh, FPG, at, uh, um, uh, FTP, etc. And there are all type of object entries and function calls to support that as well. The second two layers con, uh, 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 contain the interfacing towards uh, 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 the interfacing and uh, uh, processing towards uh, uh, Compact.com. And everything is in plain C, so you can see what, what is happening, but uh, they are grayed out because it's not the intention that you change them yourself. At the moment we have an update, you simply can uh, uh, update those layers uh, if you want. Um, the first layer is handling all those uh, those objects. Uh, uh, it's more or less uh, um, uh, uh, changing the data you you deliver from your application into its messages, which are transmitted to to Compact.com and the other way around. And the lower part is uh, is the driver uh, uh, setup to exchange those messages towards Compact.com. And that's between those uh, uh, um, hardware interfaces completely different. Uh, serial is a quite older ping pong uh, uh, solution, so it's like a cyclic handling. You send something and you get direct something back. Uh, if you use parallel, uh, um, MP40 will uh, act uh, uh, as a quasi uh, as a dual port RAM. And in case of SPI, uh, uh, several messages are combined uh, uh, in a buffer and clocked out towards the uh, 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 towards Compact.com where you get uh, at the same time your uh, uh, your message and information uh, back. Uh, last but not least, you have to adapt the software to your target hardware, and that can be, of course, always uh, different. And there we have to have made it uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as simple as, uh, as possible. All the uh, um, hardware, uh, um, uh, hardware lines uh, I discussed before, are uh, connected uh, uh, to individual uh, uh, low-level parts in uh, in the driver. You can fill in quite uh, quite easily. Simply to give you an uh, example, uh, uh, for reset, uh, uh, we have uh, a call uh, um, uh, uh, activate uh, reset, and in that call you activate the IO pin you have defined for for reset. Uh, and a little bit later, uh, there's a uh, really, uh, there's, uh, the release reset uh, a call simply to switch off uh, uh, reset. Uh, sending data, uh, uh, clocking data to Compact.com, for example, over SPI, looks like uh, in the same simple way, you get two buffers, an input buffer and an output buffer, uh, and, and, and a counter with the amount of bytes, and you simply clock them out to Compact.com, or you put them into your SPI uh, uh, buffer, uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, on the type of hardware you uh, uh, you have. Um, please note that um, 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 uh, please note that uh, uh, all uh, um, all software comes with uh, uh, examples how how it's implemented within Linux. Uh, 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 within uh, 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 STM uh, microcontrollers, for uh, for example, to uh, 
to help you up uh, quite uh, uh, quite easily. Uh, down the line, you need uh, uh, um, two types of, uh, uh, of resources to support CompactCon. That's uh, uh, the, uh, the interrupt, an interrupt line uh, uh, and a an, uh, uh, 10 millisecond uh, uh, timer for setting up uh, uh, the timing uh, between um, your software, between the software interface and, uh, and CompactCon. Okay, now we have set up the hardware and the software, and then we can uh, uh, check from, uh, uh, from our application uh, side to set up our variables, to set up our ADIs. And to do so, uh, uh, I have uh, made an example with a, with a tower light, uh, uh, two push buttons and a temperature gauge. And with, self, with help of some interface uh, electronics and a microcontroller, they are connected to, uh, uh, to CompactCon. And setting up ADIs is uh, quite straight uh, uh, forward. You give them an, uh, a number, uh, um, uh, you give them a variable uh, uh, name, uh, um, and you set up uh, the variable type. And for tower lights, we have an array of five Boolean, five bits, uh, light is on or off. Um, for uh, the push buttons, uh, we have, uh, uh, again, an array, but in that case, two Booleans. And for the temperature gauge, uh, we have uh, assigned uh, uh, integer. And please note the data direction. Read is from the network. You read from the network. And write is you write towards the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, net, the network. And um, all this uh, information is passed to, uh, 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 to PLC according to the network you, you are using. And that you can influence if, if you want. For example, the ADI number makes clear where it's mapped into, uh, into a protocol. ADI 100, for example, will be in index 100 of Profinet or Profibus, but will be in index uh, 2100 of Ethercard Powerlink can, uh, uh, can open. If you want, you, you can set up your complete mapping yourself. Uh, as Jerry already made clear, that's less uh, uh, important uh, uh, because uh, um, uh, you can download the EDS from uh, uh, CompactCon and it's uh, uh, set up. And then the PLC directly knows that you're discussing tower lights, push buttons, and temperature gauge. And it's less important where they are mapped uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the variable mapping of, uh, uh, of, an, of a network. Now we have defined those variables, we can uh, add them to, uh, uh, to software. And then we have an awful lot of possibilities how you can add variables to software. Uh, when you want, uh, if you have a modular type of software, you can first detect which hardware, uh, uh, or which hardware or which module, software models you have, uh, and then dynamically define each uh, variable uh, to, uh, to compact con if you want. Uh, um, uh, but you can also quite easily uh, set up them statically uh, by filling in an, uh, a table. And such a table contains of, uh, 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 of the ADI number, uh, uh, the variable name, uh, um, the data uh, type, uh, and the number of elements. And then you get the attributes, and that becomes it, uh, 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 interesting because First of all, you have to read and write attribute for the data uh, direction. The attribute map makes clear that, um, uh, that such a uh, variable can be mapped into uh, uh, the real-time data uh, exchange. You can define which uh, variables can be part of the real-time data exchange and which not. For example, if you would have a variable which is about configuration, which is only written, uh, written or read once by uh, 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 by a PLC. You normally not make it part of a real-time exchange that uh, 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 can uh, request it only once with help with help of acyclic uh, request, for example. If you are Im implementing cloud communication like MQTT and OPC UA, you can uh, simply add attributes. Uh, uh, to your variables to make them available towards the cloud 
uh, uh, as well, if, uh, if you want. The next one is the pointer towards uh, um, the, um, the target location, the variable inside your target uh, uh, application. Please note, uh, it's not intended that you read or write uh, uh, um, variables to CompactCon yourself. It's seamlessly done by, by the software interface with help of this Keeper Life uh, uh, interface. So uh, um, within the Keeper Life uh, uh, interface, uh, um, with help of the point of tower lights, the information of tower lights is picked up and written into uh, uh, CompactCon. Uh, um, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, it, it's, uh, it's a read. So uh, uh, at the moment, the variable is being changed by CompactCon. Uh, um, um, the data uh, uh, will be uh, uh, stored in your in your tower lights. Uh, um, a variable which is pointed by uh, F uh, tower light. Uh, and for temperature, for example, it's working the, the other way around. Um, furthermore, there are some structure uh, pointers available. You can, if you would like to, you can set up a complete self-defined uh, data type, uh, uh, which would act like all other normal uh, data types to put it in, uh, in that way. And you can uh, uh, use pointers to service routines. Uh, um, when variables are read or, uh, or written. For example, at the moment, tower light is, uh, uh, is written. You could uh, call uh, uh, the function set light and, for example, check if it's correctly uh, when the PLC tries to switch on tower lights, uh, red and green at the same moment. Uh, um, um, you could, uh, for example, priority prioritize uh, uh, red in that, uh, that uh, function uh, routine. Uh, please note, this is a very simple uh, solution with only three variables. You could set up uh, hundreds of variables if you, uh, if you want, and you can set up a menu chart. Uh, for example, when you would uh, uh, set up an, a drive type uh, uh, um, of software of communication interface, then you are discussing uh, um, and there are po several possibilities to control such a drive. You can do it by torque, you can do it by speed, if you could do it by, by distance, uh, that type of items. With all different variables you want to use, you can set, a, set up a complete uh, uh, a set of uh, variables. Uh, default map only those variables which you would use in the default uh, state and allow uh, the uh, during uh, uh, startup and configuration, allow the PLC and the PLC programmer uh, 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 as a menu chart to select uh, the variables they want uh, uh, to use in that specific application uh, uh, and omit all, uh, all others. In such a way, you can be very flexible in, uh, uh, in setting up your network uh, interface and supporting uh, 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 several applications, uh, 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 several environments with only one single software. Uh, solution. Okay, now we have uh, uh, discussed the hardware and, uh, and software, and uh, it's time to uh, 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 to uh, uh, to try it out and to uh, to test it. Unfortunately, in a webinar, that's not possible to do physically. So I will give you uh, a small uh, um, uh, presentation about it. Uh, in this case, I used an STM32 evaluation uh, uh, kit. Uh, um, on top of this kit, an M40 uh, option board is uh, mounted with the M40 uh, connector. And inside the option board, uh, uh, a module is, uh, is mounted. Please note, the option board is only for physical dimensions. Uh, uh, there are no active components or something like that. Only some dip switches. Uh, 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 and I/O pins to uh, 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 to make several configurations uh, 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 possible, and uh, um, uh, there are some variables uh, uh, set up. And they have a very basic uh, 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 application. At the moment, I turn the yellow potentiometer. You will see that the, uh, um, the value will change in uh, in the display, and that's sent out. Uh, 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 over the network uh, uh, towards the target uh, PLC. 
And for interfacing, we use uh, SPI, which uh, uh, means that we have uh, a data in and a data out uh, uh, channel, uh, a clock and an enable uh, uh, line. So in total, four lines. We have an interrupt, a reset, uh, 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 and uh, 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 a power. So in total, we, we are using eight lines to interface between uh, 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 the targets, if uh, the, your target uh, uh, application, the STM evaluation kit, and Compact Core. Of course, we don't have for all uh, um, evaluation kit on the market uh, uh, option boards uh, available, uh, uh, but we also have general purpose uh, solution. We understand if you only have to connect eight wires between uh, uh, an option board uh, and your target uh, uh, hardware, you can set up uh, a compact com uh, uh, quite, uh, quite easily. And please note, in general, you need about uh, uh, to start up uh, in roughly three to five days to have this uh, up uh, and, uh, and running. A total project will be uh, uh, longer, uh, uh, and that's of course depending uh, uh, on uh, um, uh, on the certification uh, uh, part, you have to do as an external uh, uh, laboratory. But uh, the interface uh, itself and the exchange of uh, information between a PLC and the interface only cost you uh, three to five days. I always get questions about uh, customers, uh, how to exchange the first messages, but that's not, in, uh, 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 that's not needed. Uh, um, the, uh, the most important is that the SPI is up uh, and running. When that functions correctly, everything is functioning cor cor correctly, and you can directly and Compacon can directly full-blown exchange uh, information over the network. Uh, um, and to avoid disappointment in advance, the M40 is a slave module, which means it can only communicate to PLC when it's up and running. I get enthusiastic uh, customers on uh, on the phone installing CompactCom for the first time and uh, making clear that not is, nothing is happening. That's clear. Uh, you first have to uh, have the, the full software uh, uh, running and the, uh, uh, the software needs to configure CompactCom before uh, it uh, appears on, uh, uh, on on the network for, for obviously uh, uh, reasons. Um, I will give back to uh, to Cherry uh, for uh, for some uh, uh, wrap up. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, we need to speed up a bit because we are running uh, out of time for the uh, webinar to keep the one hour. Uh, but let's uh, summarize briefly the benefit of the of the solution. What we propose you is rapid development with low uh, investment ahead. Um, especially that compared to an in-house with uh, component and stack design. Very often you see here the first level, which is the component price for your design, where we uh, often figure out from our customers that when they go this path, they have a lot of hidden cost, time to market, maintenance and update, implement new functionalities, get that up and running, uh, build up the expertise. But as well, uh, during the life cycles, component obsolescence, we have seen that over the past couple of years, uh, happens a, a lot now in, uh, has happened a lot and are binding all the resources. So our challenge is, or our proposal is to reduce your uh, hidden cost included to such a project in, and focus on what you are good at. That means at your core expertise with the ready to use and all implemented uh, solution. We help you to reduce your risk, your implementation time in order to have a reduced time to market or faster time to market. Once you have implemented the network, you have as well a quicker path to expand to new networks, to new protocols. So that means to qu be quicker in addressing more markets. And as well, once you have implemented this protocol neutral um, 
interface, you can collect, you can connect on the existing technologies. You get maintenance of the existing technologies from our side without uh, changes on this compatibility. But as well, you have as well access to all the future network that will come because we comply to this common interface. So that means for you, we have an average uh, information from our customers that they cut by 70% the cost, the development cost uh, by the first network. And that's uh, reaching up to 90% in for all the further um, network protocols. So uh, we will propose you this ready to use solution. So do not hesitate to uh, come back to us after this um, presentation uh, or ask your question now. So Brian, I, I don't know how much time we still have to address uh, a couple of the questions that came. I've seen that uh, several of them uh, are already in the chat. Yes, well, uh, we are running a little over time, but I mean, thanks so much for those valuable insights. I can see why you are the go-to guys in industrial communication and IoT solutions for the automation market. Now, your presentation sh certainly shed a lot of light on the complexities of industrial networking and also how the innovative solutions can make a real impact. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's learned a lot, and it's it's a very complex uh, subject. So if we're going to q and I'll start off with my own question first. Uh, with it being such a complex environment, do you offer training for implementers of, of your solutions? Yeah, we have different uh, ways to support our customers. Uh, first, an easy an easy approach. We have an e-learning uh, section in our uh, uh, website, which helps in different videos to address the different um, elements of the hardware of the software implementation. So you are here uh, in a very first stage, uh, quickly quickly helped. We have user manuals, but we are as well offering webinars or seminars to uh, do some consulting, to do some deeper dive in uh, the expectation of our customers in order to help them to have a first and an easy first step with our, with our uh, um, with interfacing our module. So we want to help them on this on this path, and especially to uh, apprehend this specific field bus or isn't it industrial, isn't it network principles uh, and, and adapt them to their own device mapping. Yeah. Great, okay, so you don't leave them hanging. And no. then of course, we've got our usual questions which we always get uh, alexander would love to have the slides yes we don't expect you to have memorized this entire presentation uh, you will get a handout via email if you've joined us today and michael wants to know if there'll be a recording of the webinar yes it will be on elector.tv that will take you to our youtube channel within the next few days now back to your product uh raul asks Cybersecurity expectations are increasing how is this aspect taking in account with the uh, HMS solution taken into account? Yeah, here as well, we see as well that uh, based on new regulation, uh, cybersecurity will be quite critical for all devices with, uh, with Ethernet connectivity. Um, we have our modules which are communicating mainly the traditional uh, field buses and, and, and this is what we presented here. We focused on that. We have as well um, a further version which covers all the IoT like OPC, UAM, QTT on top of the field bus in parallel to share data on the controller for the process and to share information health information, status information for all the IoT application. And here we implemented all the encryption uh, functionalities. We uh, implemented trusted uh, platform management uh, chip, uh, yes, dedicated security chip, root of trust, signed firmware, and so on. So that you have here as well a platform with the latest security options to be here on a, on a, yeah, on a, on a future proof pass with, uh, with this implementation for today, but as well, a solution that can um, implement all the the next encrypted field bus communication mechanisms that are currently in the specification right now, and that will be certainly uh, yeah, released and, and active in the coming years regarding yeah, secure field bus communication. 
So that's it's covered. <laughs> Completely covered. Um, now, in terms of customization and control, uh, Dries wants to know, is the firmware for the NP40 available as source code or as binary? Um, the, firm, the firmware is available as, uh, as binary. It's completely uh, uh, signed off. Um, um, so um, it's all only by accepted by, by N, NP40 if it fulfills all, uh, 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 all security uh, uh, items uh, built in. Okay, yeah, great. The target, so, sorry, the, the target for this binary availability is we provide a pre conformance device. So that means uh, we take responsibility. You get it in a in a in a validated way. Uh, you implement the application, and you have a lot of flexibility over the application interface. Okay, well, that, that certainly opens up yeah. and, everything you need to customize in your particular and, environment. Updates updates have, uh, uh, are free available over lifetime. Question from Fedi. I'm sorry if I pronounced it incorrectly, uh, but how can I get info on synchronizing my target to a PTP network clock? Um, today, the PTP clock is uh, is an evolution that we uh, will implement in in one of the next uh, version of the of the module. So these are uh, requirements that we get from for the synchronization of the of the protocol. Is that can you confirm that, Kurt? That's correct. Okay, so this is something that we see as, as demand for, for cybersecurity for as well, uh, I would say OPC UA communication, and this will, be, this will be available certainly by the end of the year or next, uh, next year, incl included in the module. Okay, and then just in terms of future proofing, does the 32-bit uh, ARM that you're using, the Cortex-M3, does it have a lot of room to breathe or do you feel the need to advance to newer Cortexes in future evolutions of the product? We, we are always looking to, uh, 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 to that one. Um, please note that uh, in development, uh, uh, we are already working on the next generation of, uh, of protocols, uh, 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 TSN, and we already have it on the market for Mitsubishi. The, um, uh, um, we also, uh, as Terry already indicated, have security chip uh, 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 implemented for uh, uh, for cybersecurity uh, communication, and it all still fits in the uh, uh, Cortex M3 uh, uh, environment, um, uh, um, where we are uh, um, in terms of breeze. Uh, I'm, I'm working is larger uh, uh, larger storage for uh, for our firmware. Okay, so continuously evolving. Well, we are over time, but we've managed to take some questions. And okay, <laughs> thanks for joining us, Kurt and Thierry. That was certainly very complex and in-depth. And for, for our audience, if you found today's discussion enlightening, you won't want to miss our next deep dive into the fascinating world of Bluetooth Low Energy or BLE devices tomorrow. Get ready to unlock their secrets through the art of reverse engineering. From investigating device characteristics to decompiling mobile apps, our next webinar is a treasure trove of hands-on knowledge, just like this one today was. You'll even have a chance to win a book by Kuhn Verflusen, the uh, presenter of tomorrow's webinar, and he's an expert on BLE communication and reverse engineering. So whether you're an enthusiast, a developer, or a seasoned tech professional, this is your chance to up your game in BLE. So stay tuned. That's tomorrow at 4 p.m. in Europe. So that's, uh, I think, 2 p.m. 1400 UTC, depending on where you are in the world. And that's it for today. Thanks once again, Terry and Kurt, for those valuable insights. I think when the presentation is available on YouTube, it's definitely worth another view because it was very complex and very in-depth. Thanks for joining us. Have a good day. Bye-bye. And thank you to all our audience for joining us. We'll see you again in our next webinar tomorrow. Bye-bye.